Welcome to the Fibromyalgia Podcast with me, Health and Wellness Editor, Therity Clark. Fibromyalgia is a chronic pain condition which goes largely undiagnosed and for which there is currently no cure. Yet in the UK alone, it is estimated that around 1.5 million people are sufferers. Poor diagnosis and zero cure mean suffering and silence is a common theme in the chronic pain community. Created in conjunction with the Fibromyalgia magazine, this podcast aims to break this silence because we believe that the more we share, the more ways we will discover for fibromyalgia sufferers to lead happier, healthier lives. We'll be covering and oversharing everything you ever wanted to ask about fibromyalgia, but didn't know who or where to turn to, with conversations with some of the most interesting and thought-leading people, both within as well as outside of the fibromyalgia space, to give you information, insight and inspiration for diagnosing and coping with fibromyalgia. Because even though something is invisible, that doesn't mean it should be kept in the dark. A physiotherapist and nutritional advisor, Nora Wickerson combines her own personal experience of fibromyalgia with her professional expertise to help patients to, in her own words, learn to live without fibromyalgia. For the last 20 years, Nora has been using a treatment plan she calls the combination approach to help sufferers get well. Nora believes that fibromyalgia is a collection of symptoms indicating that the body is well out of balance and the combination approach looks to target the root cause of the symptoms before embarking on a personalised 10-point plan that includes dietary overhauls and hands-on physiotherapy. To date, Nora has helped over 5,000 people live happier, healthier lives. Hi Nora, thank you so much for joining me this morning. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity of doing this podcast. It's uh, exciting and terrifying at the same time. (laughs) It's absolutely fine. It's very informal. We just want to hear about all the great work that you're doing. Um, So you are a physiotherapist and nutritional advisor. And like lots of people who dedicate their lives to helping people with chronic illnesses, you've committed yourself to this area of work as a result of your own personal experience. Can you just kind of give us a quick overview of um, how your personal experience with fibromyalgia impacted your life? Okay, well, I started with um, severe symptoms of fibromyalgia soon after having a fall in the snow when I was only age 19 and halfway through my physio training. Um, I injured my neck and back at that time, but it wasn't really um, dealt with very well. So more and more symptoms then gradually came in with the fatigue, brain fog, eye symptoms, and lots of bizarre symptoms Mm -hmm. that, um, you know, made me be called a a medical oddity. What what sort of symptoms were class bizarre? What sort of things were bizarre? Well, I think the fact that pain would move around the body. So in a morning, it could be in one area. In an afternoon, it could be in another how you felt, you know, one hour could be totally different to how you would feel in an hour's time. And the reaction to and hypersensitivity to so many things was, you know, just appeared out of nowhere, really, um, to lights and noises, sounds and things like that, that, that just, you know, as, as if your body had just wasn't your body anymore and you weren't in the control that you wanted to be of your body but I think my physio training of encouraging all patients to have a can-do approach yeah really helped me to dig deep and you know I, I, I just had to learn to micromanage these ongoing troublesome symptoms for you know for over 20 years because it took that long to get an actual diagnosis gosh um, 20 with, years and so then what was the kind of was there a specific thing that for you worked much better than anything else in order to manage your symptoms and enable you to live kind of the best life that you could be living? Well, when I received my diagnosis, finally in the year 2000, um, I just became like on a mission mm-hmm. to get to the root of each of my symptoms. 
and I very quickly realized that particular foods that were only moderately high in sugar were playing a huge part in contributing to many of my troublesome symptoms. And I think they were causing like a low-grade inflammation in the body. Right. And I, I went about then to, to take all these burdens, as I referred to them, out of my body. And the results were, were you know, literally life-changing over a matter of weeks. And the saying that life begins at 40, you know, was certainly true for me. <laughs> and to get to the stage then of being able to wake up um, in the morning with a, a clear, with a clean slate, basically, for the day ahead, you know, was a, was a, just um, a, a revelation, really, to me. And it still is a joy, even today. But why did it take 20 years before anyone made the connection between food and your symptoms? Well, I mean, are we then sort of now become quite blasé about, um, you know, food generally? Do, do, do people sort of think, oh, you know, I can eat what I fancy, when I fancy it, as often as I fancy it, and, you know, Foods, particularly simple sugars, can be very addictive. Mm -hmm. And then once we've got into that pattern, it's very hard to, to take that step back and see, you know, could that be causing the problem? You think of those foods as your friends because temporarily they do make you feel a little bit better, you know, at least mood-wise. But then what I realised was that I'd always been very dependent on... Um, the blood sugar levels basically being quite unstable mm -hmm. and realised that I always had to eat really regularly otherwise I became very hungry as it's now yeah. called um, and that the simplest things to get when you feel like that are again more of the simple sugars but once they were taken out of my diet and I then got my blood sugar levels onto like as level as a milk pond, so just flickering, none yes. of this up and down yo-yoing that it was doing like on a roller coaster, then I realised so many, um, you know, symptoms, particularly this feeling of being overwhelmed mentally and physically. That was just so well controlled once I'd got my blood sugar levels. So I just spent more and more time researching about this reactive hyperglycemia, mm -hmm. as it's known, which is not the same as a hyperglycemia attack that diabetics have, okay? And medically, it is not serious at all. But to, to people who are living with it, then, you know, it does affect your life quite a bit because you can lose concentration, it can cause anxiety, it causes that internal shakiness, it can cause the build-up of a fat pad around people's midriffs, which right. again, we know is not healthy. And all that is under, you know, sort of our control to sort out and can be sorted out in six to eight weeks. Right, with, okay. You know, information diet. Let's, let's backtrack a bit. So you... Um... I figured out that sugar was um, a potential cause for lots of your symptoms. You've got your own um, levels under control. And then you started looking into your patients who were displaying similar symptoms. You were then, by this point, combining your physiotherapy with nutritional studies. And you have come up with this very unique um, approach for clients called the combination approach, which you're now celebrating 20 years of, Yes, I think. 20 years, yeah. So could you explain what the combination approach is? Because, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you're the only only person in the UK that offers this method? That's that's what I'm led to believe, yes. Yes, I, I, I don't know of anyone doing, you know, the exact combination that, uh, that I do, um, you know, sort of on my own, as it were. Mm -hmm. The well, I was found that the if then people understand more about what is happening to their bodies, then they can 
start to work back to think about, well, what are the roots of each of those symptoms? And that's crucial, really. We've got to get back to the roots of each of those symptoms and see if then we can deal with the root and then the symptom can improve. Yes, so, so rather than just finding a cure. Yeah, sorry, like with the reactive hypoglycemia, we take him back the root. They are not as good at dealing with simple carbohydrates as some of the people are. Therefore, over time, it has caused problems with unstable blood sugar levels and erratic blood sugar levels, etc. So we take out the as much of the simple carbs as we can and put in instead complex carbs, which right. take time then to break down. So the dietary advice to control this reactive hypoglycemia that some um, sufferers of fibromyalgia will know that they have already got because they know the symptoms of it. Others hadn't realised that they had a degree of that. But that is paramount to the success of the combination approach. Okay, so um, hang on, let me get this straight. You... You believe that many, many um, people with fibromyalgia symptoms, they will have reactive hypoglycemia? Of, yes, of either, you know, sort of a moderate degree or sometimes quite severe. They often realise that they are very different to other members in their family when, you know, sort of like two to three hours after food, particularly if they then exert themselves, it's like whoa, you know, I, I'm not feeling good at all. And as I said, it can affect them mentally as well as physically. And So is it like a, um, a sugar slump after eating? Yes, yes, and anybody can have it. So it isn't exclusive to people with fibromyalgia, okay? Anybody can have reactive hyperglycemia. And just because you've got rea reactive hyperglycemia does not mean to say that they will go on and develop fibromyalgia. Right, so it's, it's quite a murky area then. And so can you test for it? Well, there's no actual test because medically, as I say, it is not serious. And the reason for that is that when people have eat simple sugars, then our body reacts by producing insulin to try and bring it back down, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, it seems to be that people with this tendency to reactive hyperglycemia have this, what I call, overreaction to everything syndrome. Right. So it's like when their body overreacts and produces too much insulin for the amount of the blood sugar level. But then because they have produced so much insulin, it brings their blood sugar level down much quicker mm -hmm. than it should do. Okay. So what so sort then of um, symptoms? Peaked. Yes, they've peaked and then they're coming down to a trough quickly. And it's that speed of coming down the trough that then triggers us to produce adrenaline to release glucose from your stored supplies. Okay? Yeah. You've now got this extra adrenaline that can make you feel quite jittery, shaky, anxious, etc. And then you have to produce noradrenaline to balance the adrenaline that you produced that really you didn't need to produce. And if you'd kept your blood sugar levels totally stable and not had the peaks, you wouldn't have then had the troughs. You wouldn't then be having this extra um, problem with the, the you know, adrenaline and noradrenaline and neurotransmitters. Okay, so they take messages you know, around the nervous system. But when they are needing to be broken down, they become neurotoxins, poisons for the nervous system. So again, that can then make people feel quite low, mm -hmm. quite negative, no energy, etc. And that's then the slump that people will, will, will sort of refer to. But it gets even more, you know, sort of, exaggerated in people who already got the fatigue right. of fibromyalgia. So it's kind of your body producing an excess of lots of different things resulting in a whole host of different symptoms from feeling low and anxious to feeling jittery. What other symptoms could somebody display? Yeah, I mean it can give them headaches. As I say, feeling overwhelmed I think sums it up quite well. 
but some people refer to it as walking through treacle, feeling like their plug has been pulled. Mm-hmm. And of course, the, you know, then they don't feel in the mood to think, or oh, I've now got to go and cook a proper meal. So unfortunately, then they'll go and, you know, for the snacks. instead have some simple carbs again, um, which could be in the form of potatoes and bread. But we know there's a lot of sugars in those as well. It's not necessarily that they're reaching for a chocolate bar all the time. It can still be hidden sh- simple sugars. And in your um, practice then with clients, is reactive hypoglycemia kind of the first thing that you try and balance That's out? That's right. Yes, yes. So the dietary changes is geared to controlling the reactive hypoglycemia. And then once that again is controlled, hopefully that's reducing their chances of getting insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. And also it can help control weight. And again, if people feel fitter, they're more, you know, going to be able to take on more physical activity and get fitter, as it were. But it allows us also... To, to deal with then the other um, root causes of their, their, their other sim- troublesome symptoms of fibromyalgia. Right, so um, the combination then, approach, initially you tackle reactive hypoglycemia via yes. dietary changes. So um, you've said what we eat and drink today will determine how we feel and how our body performs tomorrow. Do you then set yeah. your clients um, a meal plan? Is it tailored to each individual? Yes, yes, it's tailored to them. So I find if we can gear it to their likes and dislikes and different preferences, um, then they're much more likely to stick to it. Okay. So it's I, I get them to send me a three days of what they're currently eating, mm-hmm. and then we adapt that together so that they they have input and things and then they keep a diary for a while and let me know and sort of say you know is this looking okay so we do that for their meals for their snacks and hopefully then you know they've got something to focus on and go away with but it's no point telling people they've got to eat this this and this if they think "Mm, no i really don't like eating that i'm Mm -hmm. not going to eat that okay so sometimes it's not as ideal as I think it should be, but we can edge towards that. So some people do have to take a little bit longer to make the changes because they could be really, you know, already quite um, addicted is a strong word, but used to eating certain types of foods. Yeah, so is it a case of somebody, have you seen a correlation in people coming with symptoms that have kind of a, a high sugar diet or a diet that's considered kind of not optimally healthy? Yes, okay, yes. Most patients of fibromyalgia, when they consult me and they they show me what they eat, it's not so much that, you know, they might even say, oh, I don't eat any chocolate or sweets. Mm -hmm. But what they're saying are are things like, you know, I'm having a tea cake for breakfast, I'm having a a scone mid-afternoon, I'm having a sandwich at lunchtime. So, you know, there can be lots of hidden sugars and they're concentrating on the bread with the sandwich instead of having it like, you know, sort of lots of other things with a little bit of of, of bread or some other carbohydrate um, with it. So, yes, the vast majority um, will either add pork cobs or they will be ones that are hidden in their diet and they're not thinking that they're you know, making that mistake, but, mm-hmm. you know, once pointed out and the, uh, you know, when they feel the difference, when they're not having them, they realise that, uh, you they know, feel they feel better. Working. So there's a and big, then with the, yes, there's sorry. a big piece of education to do then around the types of food, which actually people may think are healthy or not spiking their blood sugar levels, but actually they do contain, there's these hidden sugars that we need to be kind of, mm talking more loudly about yes no definitely and you know i remind them we aren't just what we eat but what we're able to metabolize from what we can absorb from what we manage to digest from what we eat and nutrients can be lost at any of those stages Mm -hmm. you know protein can be lost at any of those stages so you could eat exactly the same as your next door neighbor but yet get 
a totally different amount of nutrients from it right, because yeah. of how your body is, is able or not able to, to work. And that can depend on your genetics and mm -hmm. so many other factors um, with it. Okay then, so somebody is taking the steps to um, balance out their nutrient levels and their sugar levels via their diet, but it's not just diet alone that you focus on. Right. No, that's right. So, so the diet, as I say, that's paramount. And generally, then they'll have, you know, I, I, I like them to have done that for six to eight weeks for when we move on to the other stages, as it were. And then I exercises because eye symptoms, and I know this personally because I had all of these. You know, people will have eye pain, eye strain, vertigo, dizziness, watery eyes, changing vision difficulty sometimes reading for any length of time all those sorts of symptoms again impact on our lives yeah of course and yet some, you know there's some very simple eye exercises that i teach in person once we find you know because I, I find that so often they've got trigger points in their postural eye muscles mm -hmm. so it's not the actual workings of the eye or anything that can be picked up in a you know an appointment at the opticians it's the actual muscles that move the eyeball that are you know have got the problems because again they're postural muscles and it's postural muscles that get a build-up of these waste products in fibromyalgia that's really interesting so it's kind of um like a gym workout for your eye muscles yeah exactly exactly and then they can carry on doing those every day for you know sometimes six eight weeks and then they just need to do them periodically after that to make sure that they're not creeping back in but, you know, generally, once people have done the diet for several weeks, then, the, you know, everything else is, is able to sort of hold itself so much better once they've then uh, been corrected. And then correct breathing patterns, really important. So I find most sufferers of fibromyalgia have a poor pattern of breathing and they easily over-breathe. What do you so mean by over-breathe? Well, they are breathing too many times per minute, basically. Yeah. So even at rest, when they first arrive, I'll be watching them and I'll think, whoa, you know, that, that's 14 breaths a minute when they're sat not doing anything. And, you know, generally we should only need about 11 or 12. And then you'd go up to 14 or 15 when you're then walking around the room or yeah. going upstairs and that type of thing. How interesting. What do you, why, why is that? Possible. Why well, that, that is very relevant because I find that they have these trigger points in their intercostal muscles. So the intercostals are the little muscles between the ribs, mm -hmm. okay? And they're, again, postural muscles. And as I've said earlier, it's postural muscles that are ones that get the problem because they don't have as good a blood supply. They're called white muscles, even though they're still pink. But they're white because they have less of a good, less blood going to them. But that also means they'll have less lymphatic drainage to take away waste products. So waste products can accumulate much easier in postural muscles. And what can happen is that these intercostal muscles are like pieces of elastic. But now with trigger points in them, they're like knots in pieces of elastic. And everyone knows, you know, you stretch a piece of elastic, you can't stretch it as far once it's got a couple of knots in it. Yeah. Okay. So what happens is that they lose this bucket handle action that our lower ribs should do when we take a breath. Yeah, it comes out like the handle of a bucket. Yeah, I'm practicing breathing now. Yeah, okay, that's right. So if you then haven't got a good bucket handle action, okay, and you can't use the bases of the lungs, even though they've probably got perfectly healthy lungs, okay, but they're going to then use the upper part of the chest to breathe, because it hurts too much to take a deep breath, basically. But the longer you don't take the deep breath, the more of these trigger points can build up because they're not being exercised. Those knots aren't being stretched to even, you know, help them pull out. And I also get, so then when they do exert themselves, they're out of breath very easily because they're already sort of breathing at a rate that somebody else would be. Um, and they have to go up to the next level right. to, to go up a flight of stairs, etc. So everything has a knock-on effect. So because of yeah, one thing, on that will create another symptom because of the 
stress yeah. and strain is putting yeah. your body under. And I have had so many fibromyalgia patients over the years that to say, oh, you know, I'm told I've got costochondritis. Well, costochondritis is a very rare inflammatory condition and there's no inflammatory markers. So the, I feel round or near the sternum, etc. find these trigger points and in 100% of cases, I've been able to... Um, resolve their supposed costochondritis in just one session because there have been trigger points there. And that's where your physiotherapy exactly. training comes that's in. That's the power of hands-on physio that rises to the challenge yet again. And, you know, it's so sad that that nowadays a lot of um, physios are not doing the, the hands-on massage that, you know... I was basically taught um, in, in, in a, an abundance of techniques, um, you know, 40 odd years ago. Right, so this um, is where your yeah. um, combination approach is unique because you're able to exactly. offer the exactly. nutritional advice yeah. and nail the dietary changes yeah. that have such a big effect. And then you're also able to do the hands-on physio, releasing the trigger points, etc. Yeah. And adapting many of the techniques um, to that. Um, need yeah and often I can teach the patient or you know the, the, the patient's partner if they come with them um, how they can then be continuing some of this treatment at home yeah and then posture and core exercises again are crucial you know I mean it's I invariably find patients with fibromyalgia presenting with what's called anterior head syndrome we used to call it poking chin syndrome which explained it very very well um with it but that then is often had adding to their headaches poor digestion and tmj dysfunction which again is such a common symptom in people with fibromyalgia so what's that can so you just explain what that is the tmj dysfunction will be temporomandibular one so they'll have a they may find they clench their teeth, grind their teeth, got a lot of tension in their jaw, and that then has a knock-on effect to so many other factors um, with it. So we work on anything to do with their posture, advising them on the, of, I advise them on their footwear, orthotics if they're pronating their feet, etc. Mm -hmm. And so many things posture-wise that that then I've Again, this domino effect, once one thing is out, yeah. then you're putting more strain on another bit of the body, etc. Um, with it. And then obviously we've mentioned about the body working techniques, that's you know a very big part of it. I get, I show them exercises to improve their lymphatic drainage because so many people with fibromyalgia are not as active as they know they should be. Because they're very tired, etc. Yeah, our lymphatics do get sluggish. And then another interesting one is to improve functioning of the adrenal glands. Now, this is again something that um, I, you know, sort of found personally um, in my case, but I again have found it uh, the case in so many of my fibromyalgia patients. So, like I was saying, the, with fibromyalgia, if, if somebody said to me, sum up fibromyalgia in one sentence, I would say the overreaction to everything syndrome. Okay? Yeah. So we talked earlier about the reactive hyperglycemia, how you go, then we can overreact to the, you know, produce too much insulin and then having to produce the adrenaline, then we pump out um, the noradrenaline. Well, we also seem to overreact to adrenaline that we produce even for good stress so i you know i can relate to the scenario of people going out for a social time with a few friends yeah and they have a very happy time but because they have produced that adrenaline which we all do when we're getting you know just being sociable etc and you know having a happy time as much as we do even it's a stressful sort of, you know, unhappy stress time. Right, yeah. Then the next day, they will feel exhausted. They're often in more pain. They often feel overwhelmed or even low in their mood. And they think, whoa, what's this about? I had a lovely time. Now, I've named this reaction reactive adrenal syndrome. 
Okay. Because the right amount of noradrenaline would have acted as a peacemaker to allow the body systems to just return to their normal state after having that extra boost of adrenaline whilst you were on your evening out. Because the noradrenaline is the one that gives us the relaxation and helps with digestion. But the overproduction of this noradrenaline inappropriately, we've then got to, to have all their breakdown products then, which as, as I said earlier, act as neurotoxins, these poisons for the nervous system. So then they make someone feel lethargic hungover and they think I didn't even have any alcohol oh, and they bake how horrible the worst kind of wired. hangover wired but tired wired but tired yeah and so that's then how, lot... how can they combat this can you put things in place right. so that before well, yes, they yes, go so out they, yeah so there, there's certain foods that we can eat that help support the adrenals and even more importantly there's certain foods that need to be removed from the diet that are, again, encouraging your body to produce adrenaline and then you overproduce the noradrenaline. So what, but, so, what sorts of foods yeah. are they? For, for which type? For, for the, um, to include in your diet. The foods to include in your diet, well, we know that there's certain amino acids, one in particular, tyrosine, that is found in egg white. And that's why egg whites are very, very calming foods. Mm -hmm. So they, they again can help, you know, and people could have those before they go out so that it's almost like they've calmed the adrenals. But I teach a, a, you know, a whole multitude of different types of exercises. Some people um, learn some Tai Chi and different basic yoga style exercises, which again can help calm yeah. the adrenals. And then obviously things like um, alcohol, caffeine, other forms of stimulants, etc. They all need to be kept out of the diet. But generally, again, once people have sorted out their reactive hyperglycemia, it allows this reactive adrenal syndrome to, to, to calm as well. I see. Okay, so it's really important to address yeah. the reactive hyperglycemia initially. Definitely. definitely. And then um, we work on improving their sleep and cognitive skills. The, what I tell to people is, remember, your body has been working extremely hard. You know, you're cross with it. I, I remember that feeling well. I've been so cross with my body for feeling that it was letting me down. Yeah. But, you know, I then realised, actually, it's been working extra hard against quite adverse conditions mm -hmm. because we haven't given it, you know, the right nutrients. We, you know, it's, it's, it's withered. So I say take back being the captain of, your, of the ship. But remember, the captain has to show good respect to his crew and he's got to treat them well to get the best out of them. Otherwise, he has a mutiny of his, on his hands. <laughs> and that's just how it feels when you have a flare-up of fibromyalgia. I love that um, analogy. And that, that's, you know, then we go on to other self-help techniques because, again, I find so many... Um, fibromyalgia patients you know I, I've got to get them to take on the psyche of a well person to be able to be to become a well person and I want them to be able to sort of believe they can be a well person again and need to be a well person again to achieve all their you know life's goals and aspirations that have been put on hold yeah for, but that's know, very tricky to do when you're feeling so out of sorts and you've got all these symptoms that are impacting your life how how can you kind of take on the psyche of a of a well person well normally it happens anyway once they have improved so much with the diet and the other um, factors that we're doing and changing you know i i get them to do um lots of affirmations lots of mindfulness visualization techniques like you know we, we've taught again as a physio student you know you you um um, we know sort of many professional sports people and gymnasts, things like that. They have to visualize the success. You know, if, if you were entering in a race and you did not believe that you could win that race, chances are you won't win, win that race. Yeah. They've got to be able to see themselves, um, you know, like the gymnasts doing the, the complicated 
uh, loose on the um, on the on the beam and things like that. So they go over it in their minds. They see themselves doing those moves, and you know we can take snippets of, of those types of techniques. And I get people to set their own short-term goals, which might even just be for that day. Mm -hmm. And then they have medium-term goals that they think, right, you know, hopefully over the next month, I would, I'd love to be able to do this. And things like, you know, they'll say, well, the house is getting in a state. And it's like, right, we'll just sort one shelf or one drawer. Don't feel overwhelmed and think you've got to tackle the whole room in one go. Yeah, taking things little by little. It, it, yeah. And normally then, you know, for people who can take it on board, then the, the, the results, you know, can be can be really good and long lasting. Um, wow, well, yeah. so this combination effect really is a combination of so many things. So yes. you, you kind of, you whiz through your 10 point plan is what you work to. So we've yeah. got diet, most importantly, eyes, breath, posture, uh, core exercises, uh, lymphatic, adrenal, sleep, and taking on this positive attitude. Self-help techniques, I call it. Yeah, the last one I call self-help techniques that uh, incorporates and anything else. Do you, would, do you advise to people that they really do need to undertake all of these points in order to have the best outcome, or for each person, is it kind of checking cherry-pick the things that really affect them? Well... We cherry pick at the start, so if they come in and I can see, well, your eye problems are, you know, sort of like number one on their list, then we will we'll do we'll sort out their eye symptoms at that first session. If their posture and things like that looks it's like, well, that can't wait, then you know, so there's no set order for the others after those first two. But the first two right. of understanding the fibromyalgia and the diet, they have to be done. And then a selection of the others will come in as as and when they, they you know, we discuss together, which we do like to do most. Um, so it's all about kind of retuning and rebalancing to find this, um, yeah, you call I it a band of balance. Fine, fine. Yeah, the fine tuning is when we've, we've uh, then done but most of them need to do all 10 factors in, you know, over the, the course of it to get the best end result. Um, because, you know, basically I find that people with fibromyalgia are, we need to learn how to walk on a tightrope. We have a very narrow band mm -hmm. of balance that our body needs to be in to be at its best. And that's, okay? the, key, that's the key difference between somebody with fibromyalgia and a quote-unquote well person is that their yes. their tightrope is thinner if you like it's harder to find the balance exactly exactly some people could have a six foot wide band and they seem to be able to get away with whatever they you know expect their body to do and whatever they put into it etc but we will probably always have been on a tightrope we just hadn't realized it mm -hmm. and you know you look at other similarities with people with fibromyalgia and you find invariably they've been people pleasers they're people who find it difficult to say no they're people who who try and put other people ahead of themselves rather than themselves and can get it you know quite poorly before they realize how stressed they have become god that's so okay. interesting that even personality traits yeah play yeah into so this. yeah so you know one of the factors with fibromyalgia is 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 it our personality that puts us at risk of getting fibromyalgia and you know possibly partly yes and then, you know, I've, I've got families where I have, you know, the grandma, the daughter and the granddaughter mm -hmm. all come to see me because really? they've all been diagnosed with fibromyalgia. So then they say, well, there must be, you know, sort of some, some link. But is the link to the tendency to have reactive hyperglycemia? Yeah. And that is what I've found in so many cases, that that seems to be the crux of the matter. So, you know, again, I'm encouraging all my fibromyalgia patients to encourage their family now not to do the diet as strictly as we have to do it. Mm -hmm. But even if they did it 80% of the time, so they're just, you know, simple sugars, that. awareness, as it were, 
and making the best choices when they can, then, and again, so many of those find, you know, the difference of, of sort of improving their, their sort of concentration and cognitive things and energy and stamina. Because again, you know, we, we need them for that. The, the, I think as well, you know, we were saying before about the um, getting into this band of balance that we need to be in, this yeah. tightrope. And again, the, what, what is a, a big passion for me is that we're not always finding our true cellular level of vitamin and minerals by standard blood tests. Yeah, that seems to be a commonality. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, there's a, a new and exciting world of medical opportunity awaiting if we can make better use of the technology in looking for metabolites. Now, metabolites are the waste products that w would be found in urine that indicate that correct metabolic processes have taken place. Interesting. And you can accurately measure different metabolites in the urine to give us information of the quality and quantity of those metabolic processes actually taking place in our cells. But is, no, is anybody doing tests for those at the moment? Well, there are a few private companies doing it, but, you know, I think the, uh, the, a big opportunity has been missed. I think we need to, you know, get back to basics we need to know accurately. A blood test, yes, shows what's in the blood, but really, that's the potential for what we can make use of it. Yeah, we've, got a, we've got a whole other podcast there, Nora. Yeah, um, it is. You speak a lot about um, instead of learning how to live with fibromyalgia, learning how to live without it. Yes. Would you say that you personally live without it? Sorry, I, I missed a little bit of that. They... You know, you speak a lot about um, instead of learning how to live with fibromyalgia, learn yes. to live without it. Would, would you say this is true for you? Do you live without it? From the fibromyalgia point of view, definitely. You know, the, 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 the pain, the stiffness, the brain fog, the eye symptoms, the, the shortness of breath, all that type of thing. Um, you know, I wouldn't be able to do everything that I do with that. And um, in terms of your patients, you've worked with, I think, about 5,000 clients. Are there I any... 5,000 when I add up all the, the different uh, ones, yes. And yes. are there any particular client successes that really stand out for you? Um, yes, I mean, they... they ones that I, I like you know a, a few of the comments are um one lady said well for the first time in in her life she felt in control of her destiny and oh. she said the combination approach isn't an immediate miracle cure and i totally agree with that mm -hmm. you have to work hard and i totally agree with that and be sensible but if you keep it up there are no limits to its benefits um, another lady said, I am now almost pain-free and have more energy than I could have imagined. It made me realise that it is the simple things that can benefit our bodies so much. Yeah. And with guidance and dedication, one can make the change back to better life. Wow, what great um, testimonials. And the combination approach, is this something that people have to learn to um, adapt to their lifestyles forever? Or can you, can you drop back to eating less to eating more sugars and things like that well what i say to people is follow it for as you know sort of about six months as strictly as they can and get as many of the benefits from it as they can and then quite a few patients say to me well i'm not going now back eating any of the foods that i was eating before and that's how i felt the benefits have just been too great to then think, yeah. no, not doing that. But some people have found that once they've got into that good band of balance, that they're able to then, like, have the odd treat, as it were, mm -hmm. or, you know, a little bit of alcohol when they go out with friends and things. And as long as they're not, you know, sort of doing that every day, yeah. then, you know, that's fine. So 
we've all got different thresholds. We are, you know, we're not all the same. Mm -hmm. It's very, very different. So a lot of people will say, oh, I find I can have a little bit of this and still be fine. But they have to just try and be honest with themselves. If they think, mm, I've eaten that and now I don't feel quite as good, then, yeah. you know, they can make that choice then, can't they? Yeah, it's about and learning to listen to your body. Yeah. But, you know, whether going, slipping back totally to the diet that we're having before, then yes, I think eventually, then their symptoms will return um, with it. So in that circumstance, you know, it's not a cure, but it can be totally maintained and kept so that you, the, you know, the vast majority of the time you can forget you've got fibromyalgia rather than having to constantly, you know, live your life with the limits that it puts on people. And it's then, you know, just seek to be the best they can be. Yeah. Um, you know, take back that control of their lives and see what little steps they can be doing themselves, um, you know, with it. That I, I need people to be sort of, I suppose, um, poorly enough and suffering enough to want to make that change, mm -hmm. but yet still have that inner fight in them left to think, yes, I can get on top of this and I can get back to, you know, living a, a, a fuller um, life than I am at the moment. Yeah, and as you said at the beginning, life really did kind of begin again for you at 40, so there's no, there's no age limit to when you can live. No, no, I've had patients, uh, you know, up to the, well, even up to the age of 80, and some of those have still been able to see some improvements. And unfortunately, I'm getting children down as young as 12 years of age being diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Oh. I mean, it's such an interesting um, approach, but there's always going to be kind of naysayers and um, critics. What would you say to anybody that's still a bit dubious about this sort of treatment angle? Well, I mean, I, I would say, you know, give it a go. What have you got to lose? If, you know, it's hard work getting well. It's hard work staying well. But it's very hard work being ill and certainly yeah. not as enjoyable. Yeah. And for anybody that's listening and is interested in exploring um, your work and the combination approach, what is, where can they find you? Um, well, they can visit my website, which is www.tacklingfibro.co.uk, or they can email me and I can send them my long document um, to read more about my approach at nora.wickerson at gmail.com. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Nora. This has been so insightful. I mean, there's so many different layers and things that we could delve into much further, but maybe we'll have to do another podcast for all of them. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed. Okay. Thank you.